if you have to explain, or when you explain what you do, you need to explain what you don't do, it means you have a problem. And that's something that happens when we talk about country branding. Everybody over the last 10 years starts saying country branding is not this, and country branding is not that. Um, it's a demonstration that actually the sector um, has some challenges. And uh, it's interesting to see that both academia, uh, professionals, everywhere uh, in the world, um, we have different visions about what is country branding. Then some say, well, no, destination branding is one thing, it's about tourism. And I say, no, it's a holistic idea. And one thing is this, one thing is that. So that's a demonstration that actually there's something that needs to be corrected in the sector. And there's one thing that we all agree, is that most of the times, country brand strategies fail. They fail, and they fail miserably. And we all know that, and we all talk about this. And we say they all fail because governments don't take it seriously. They say because um, you have different stakeholders to please. And then you say that this needs a long-term vision. And then you have to say, that this, and then that, that, and then it's not advertising, and then it's not communication, it's not the logo. How many times do you start saying it's not the logo? I mean, I wish you could bring that sentence. And we're always talking about this. For the last 50 years, everyone was. And it's interesting to see that, and the question we have to ask ourselves is, why is this happening? Is it really the country that is doing this wrong? Is it really governments that are doing this wrong? They're not doing anything wrong. They're just doing what they believe it's best. They're just doing, it, it's a current, it's a strength. And our job is not to be in this elite world of uh, academics and of practitioners like myself, saying, oh, the government says this. Our job is actually to do something about it. And instead of being always talking about that they are doing it wrong. They're doing it wrong according to us. They're doing it wrong according to our vision. So the challenge for us is to embrace that. Is to embrace the new way of how things are doing. And not just saying and criticizing how everything is being done, done incorrectly or correctly. Because let me tell you one thing. Country branding is very important for us. You say it's very important for the nation. But you talk, if I explain to you the amount of times that country branding projects were cancelled, even before they started, not to mention the ones that started, just because of political reasons, you would be surprised. Well, in this case, you're not surprised because you're in the sector and you know exactly what's the problem. So, it's time that we do something. It's time that we embrace this challenge to say, how actually are we going to work in country branding in a way that the world understands and actually can be implemented correctly. And that's our way of seeing it. That's how Bloom Consulting works. So, the main reason uh, and how Bloom Consulting works is that instead of us embracing the country brand projects as a holistic idea and an umbrella idea, that has multi-purposes, <coughs> has a purpose to strengthen the image internationally, to attract tourists, to attract talent, to um, attract investment, to uh, place a destination on the map, to talk about, to place it culturally speaking. I mean, how many objectives can a brand have? I mean, I've never seen so many objectives in a country brand strategy or any brand strategy as the countries and as a country brand strategy being implemented so far. So, the first thing, uh, the reason why uh, country branding strategies fail is because we all know it's all about the stakeholders. It's so many stakeholders managing the brand. It's so many um, interested parties managing the brand. And the interesting thing about this, about country branding, is that the own nature of country branding and the way of the nature of those stakeholders, they have completely different interests. You have interested in tourism, you have interested in investment, you have interested in culture, and all of them want different things, and you will never put them on the same page. It's like wanting to put all political parties sitting together and agreeing on something. It will never happen. It will never happen. Maybe in three countries, four in the world, 
but there's 193 countries in the world. Stakeholders, most of the times, do not agree because the nature of their business, the nature of their objective, is antagonistic. The other thing that we talk about, always about country branding, is what is country branding really for? And how can you measure country branding? And most of the times when we talk about measuring country branding, we talk about perceptions. It's very important to measure the perceptions, but how, and it's a key fundamental thing about country branding, but how can you justify that to general society to put money on, I need to change my perceptions, when you have a journalist from the opposing party or the political leader right there that says, how can you put millions into this brand strategy when there's people starving? Why are you putting money into something that is about an image and not so much about education or about anything related to healthcare? So, the own metrics of country branding, and when we talk about these intangibles, <coughs> they're very difficult to measure and they are very difficult to protect. So, we have to do something about it. And what we do something about it, at least we do it like this. I'm not saying that this is the way everything should be done, but just saying how we do it, and it actually works for us, is that we separate the objectives of country branding. <coughs> country branding is not one thing. Country branding is three things. We call this the three T approach, attraction of trade, tourism, and talent. And these three specific objectives need to be treated separately. And you say, isn't it more country branding? Of course it's more. Of course it's much more, but these are the only three things that I can manage. These are the only three things that I can actually put a number into it. These are the three things that I can justify to general society that they need a country brand strategy. It needs to be something practic practical and easy to defend nationally. Yes, it's many more things, but I cannot measure those things. Or I cannot measure those things in a way that I can defend. And we, what we measure is numbers. We measure GDP. Country branding is about GDP impact. I don't do country brand. I deliver country, I deliver GDP impact. I deliver GDP growth. That's what I deliver. And I use country branding as a tool. Any country can use their own metrics. What is important for them? Is it happiness? Is it but the ones that we use, and this is an exercise explaining how we work, is numbers. The other thing we always do is we talk about the long-term objective. When we talk about 30 years of sector when we talk about country branding. It won't work. It won't work because in 30 years you don't imagine how many politicians will actually have touched that brand. Actually none, because they actually, the first thing they do when they touch that brand is try to change everything so that it's not associated with, with you know, the goodwill of the past political party. So you have to work in different time frames. And in those specific time frames of four years, you need to justify and to show the impact it has on the economy. That's how you're going to protect the brand. Because then when the, ne the next leader will come, it's going to be much more difficult to remove it. Because then it became a national asset. It became a tangible asset. Just the same way that, you know, physical property is an asset. If I go down there and I destroy the statue right down there, I go to jail. If I put a graffiti, or if I put a graffiti on the statue, I go to jail. If I put a graffiti on the Cardiff brand, Nothing will happen to me because it's an intangible asset. So we need to make it tangible. And if we make it tangible, then we are able to defend it. Then it's more difficult to describe. And that's how we do it. So that's why, and we separate the country brand strategies, we have different rankings. We have two rankings when we talk about country branding. We have country branding for trade and country branding for tourism. We still don't have the talent. We will. But it's two country brand rankings, which, by the way, is launched today, so as we speak, probably some of you are receiving emails about this. Uh, embrace it, <laughs> please. And I'm just going to give you a, a small demonstration on, on what I mean variation <coughs> on, on the ranking before going into the case that I'm going to talk about. So in trade, you've seen that the top five, top six have not ch uh, ch changed dramatically, so there's nothing really um, the difference of what was going from uh, last year, uh, except an absolute boredom of the first six that have not changed absolutely. Now, it gets more interesting when we talk about tourism. Um, as we've seen, that uh, two countries came out of the top ten, and two countries, we treated Macau for the first time as a country, um, came in together with Turkey for the top ten. So, 
You have more information about this. You can download the ranking. We have the 193 countries. Some of them are not included because that was not available. But we spent 11 months of the year investigating this. A team of 10 people, one by one country. So we work with two rank strategies. And whenever we approach a country, we say, or a destination, we say, we either we ask, what is this brand strategy for? And it can be only other, these three, trade, tourism, or talent, or we recommend what should it be. So in this case, I'm going to talk about how we apply this methodology into, in this case, a very interesting one, because it was creating a city from scratch, and it was in Brazil. Um, now we talk about countries, but uh, it's the same methodology when we talk about cities, when we talk about regions, when we talk about other destinations. And Brazil is the whole other world. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a new, so you understand, it was a new uh, city next to an existing city, which is called um, Belo Horizonte. So Belo Horizonte is right here. Um, it's one hour away from, from Sao Paulo or Rio by plane. And um, this new city, uh, that was next to Belo Horizonte, was next to what we call the Aeropolis. It was a completely entire new city, 100, 11 million square meters, uh, that had just pure land. And we were invited to develop a country brand strategy, a destination brand strategy, before they even started building anything. So it was a dream come true. It's like, oh my god, <laughs> you know, it's one of those cases. This will probably never happen again, you know? So it's a great example to show. It's like, Build the brand strategy first, and then you talk about the structure, the structure, the logic, the, the idea behind it. So, we talk about Belo Horizonte, nobody probably has heard about the city. Um, Belo Horizonte has 2 million inhabitants, it has more population than Madrid. Uh, the state where it's in, it actually has half of the population of Spain. Uh, so, uh, again, it's just different out there. And we were working in, in working on creating this destination. So, when we went, with the, with, the, with the stakeholders in, in place, our objective was to create a destination, a destination from scratch. Mm -hmm. So what is the destination for us? Um, it's very simple, it's just to be on the map, both physically and um, emotionally, or in, in the head of everyone. That's what's the destination for us. And that's what we're going to create for this new destination. More interesting is that this uh, Aeropolis, this region, was a region uh, that they wanted to embrace a cluster, and it was the fashion industry. So they wanted to be a cluster fashion industry right next to it. Now, to create the destination, we have two dimensions and nine points that actually is our methodology on how actually we, we build the destination. We have the dimension of what's important and the mandatory. In the important, uh, it's the classic things about politically stable, you know, to have a good infrastructure, a uh, good transportation system to, to go there, to offer good quality of services while you're there so you enjoy it. It can be an investment destination for investors, just in general. And you have the mandatory. Of course, you have to be known, you have to be perceived for something. Those perceptions need to be aligned with reality. You need to be loved and you need to offer a unique experience. You don't need this to become a destination. And 90% of the countries, they try to position destinations, try to position themselves and offering these things. But this does not make the destination. I'll give you an example. Luxembourg. Luxembourg has all this. Has none of this. As a tourism destination. Has none of this. As an investment destination, yes, but as a tourism destination. That's why we separate them. It has all this. It's very stable and politically stable. Fantastic infrastructure, good transportation. Fantastic for Excellent. No, it's not love. Nobody really wants I'm going to go to the next On the other hand, you have the favelas in, in Rio. It has none of this, I wanted to explain. It has all of this. I'm not ever going to go to the favela in, in Rio, that's for sure. But you have a niche tourism segment that actually currently wants to go to the favela because of the experience, because of everything that it transmits, and it has nothing. And most of the times, countries try to focus on this and this and this and this. You don't need this. It's good to have, but you don't need it. So we did an assessment, and, and the big objective of all this is so that we just go back and they spend more time and they spend more money. It's, it's in the end that's what this is all about. So we, for our assessment, we have worked uh, with the uh, Saudi Business School, 
in Barcelona and the University of Minas Gerais to assess how this destination would actually rank in our variables. And this was the score. I'm not going to talk about all of them, I'm just going to talk about the red ones. This one was a very interesting case because it was a place that did not have infrastructure yet. So one of the key things was to be politically stable when we put this highlight here is that Brazil is very conservative when it comes to the environment, when it comes to social causes. So even before it starts being built, people can actually destroy it. So we have to be very cautious with that on how local society, all the stakeholders that have nothing to do with the brand, that they don't even know what branding is, can actually destroy it. And then what we have seen, of course, is that there's no, no perception associated with this. People don't really know what this is, and you don't experience anything there. You, there's nothing there. So you need to build these perceptions that offer them through products and services. I will just talk about two examples of what we have done. So this place is called Fashion City, by the way. It's not our name, but we embrace it. Fashion City Brazil, the S, that's Portuguese written, but English. Um, and the first thing that we have done was mm, beyond branding, and this is what's interesting, is we don't talk about branding with them. We never talked about with other stakeholders about branding. We created a hybrid uh, structure about the property of Fashion City. So we invited, of course, you have the shareholders, the owners of the land, and the ones that want to build something there, and you have the intangible property, which is the idea about the place. And here is when we invited, I'm not talking about the other promotional ideas, I'm talking about the environmentalists. I'm talking about the, the mayors of the surrounding cities, because it's a poor city, to be on board and to build what they believe would be the dream come true. And half of them were against it. And I said, no, no, I want them here. It's like the Godfather, you know? Like I want my enemies closer, my enemies closer. <laughs> so bring them in. Let them do whatever, but have them controlled in your house. So this was kind of a shock. So how can I have like Greenpeace and say, yes, bring them in. It's going to be a mess, but bring them better to have a mess here than outside. So that was one of the recommendations and the structure we have created. The other one, of course, is about the perceptions. And what you see here in black is the perceptions of that destination. Of course, no one knows. And we had to take it to Belo Horizonte, the perceptions of Belo Horizonte, which is the city next to it. And still, very few people associated Belo Horizonte with anything. In black, you see, I don't know what it is. I don't associate the city with. However, the one we have visited, you can see the black has come down significantly, has changed. And all positive perceptions, such as hospitality, fashion, uh, culture, and so on. So these are all different segments. Uh, that's why we have it in three sides. So they have different perceptions. Once they are in, and all positive. They all love the city. So we had something there, but we need to build around it. And when we challenged every stakeholder, we said, okay, so what is the city going to be about? What are we going to do here? And it was so funny because, in a good way, it was so interesting to see that they didn't know I want to have this the best, the best cluster in fashion where you can have like the industry, uh, the academics about fashion, um, the creatives, uh, the shoppers, all together. No, everybody said, I want to build something that will last. I want to build something that will be an example for Brazil. I want to create jobs. I want to increase the local GDP. This was them saying it. I said, okay, that's very nice. But look, I'll give an example which is not a destination, but if you want to do something like that, you have to be consequent to what you are actually promising. London Olympics, the objective was to be the greenest Olympics ever. Now, if you do that, you really have to be consequent to that. You have to recycle all the materials that are there. The floor that was extremely polluted, you have to refine it completely like it was flour to make a bread. <laughs> so, it's not an easy decision. You have to stick to it. It's not just, I want to be that. Be it. And that's the only way that actually the brand is going to be received. So, we start working about the central idea about this destination. We did a great workshop with the entire team, stakeholders. We invited architects to build this with us. We invite environmentalists to build this with us. We build with people that have nothing to do with the branding. Why? Because it's the way that they understand the branding and they build the brand with us. And whenever they're going to deliver it, they're not just going to see a book about it. They're not going to see someone giving a speech about it. They build it together. And they didn't build just the, the physical, they, they, they 
automatically everything comes out naturally. It comes naturally. It's not a resistance. So, interesting words start to come up about what is the central idea. And we saw that this central idea, the objective of this central idea, is that it works as a filter to actually deliver everything, like I said about infrastructure, but also the products and services, and how you're going to leave the brand in there. In essence, central idea is what I want others to think of. It's the emotion I generate. That's what the central idea is. And that's what we're talking about here when we talk about uh, fashion city. And this is their inspirational idea. This is their central idea. Which is, I want to become an inspirational destination. I want everybody, when they come here, to feel inspired. Either it's because for business purposes, or the local stakeholders, they feel inspired that they have this new city here. The environmentalists, they feel inspired because new models are being built here. Inspiration. So the question is, how do I build inspiration? And we gave, uh, and the, the challenge was, how can I explain this? Because when a new stakeholder comes in that was not involved in the project with us, how can I actually make sure that this person feels it and actually really uh, understands what this is about? How can you make inspired. So, you need to be the first, you need to be different, and most important, you need to create a brand. You need to be the reference. You need to inspire But If you do this, you will become a reference. You will become this destination inspiration. And when we talk about inspiration, it's socially, economically, and from an environmental point of view. So, very good. Then it comes to the general questions. I have an investor that wants to open a restaurant in my new city. He has his own business model and says, how am I going to embrace that idea? Oh my god, here we go. That's when he starts saying, like, how can I say a person that has a fast food chain to be inspirational? <laughs> and how can I tell them to change the brand so that the brand feels this when they're in there? The brand is not a limitator. The, the brand is it's, a, it's like a, a magnifier. The brand is supposed to help the business model, not to limit it. So, whenever I talk with partners like this, I say, look, instead of just selling burgers, just same exactly business model, make three changes, and actually everything will change. So, you know, just think about the environment. Think about all the chain of where next actually that relationship. Employ local people that work here with us, and tell the story about it. Tell them actually you are doing this not much to ask and actually you will need it because of logistics so it has it makes business sense so this is on brand and this is aligned with the brand when we talked about academia they said that they actually wanted to have universities inside fashion city you're not going to offer an MBA inside fashion city you're going to offer an MIA master in inspirational administration and you can only find it there you tweak it to so it actually works there it's you feel the experience of everything, all the brand touch points that actually you're going to live. And when we talk about architecture, of course you need to be inspirational. You need to come in, you need, need to have a, a you know, the, the air needs to, 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 you know, to have a, a lack of, of breathing when you see it. So the, the own architecture has to respect, the, it needs to inspire, not just from a visual point of view, but again, economically and from an environmental point of view. So these were cases that show how actually the brand can become a reality if everybody's aligned and without forcing anything. And again, this was for tourism. We said this is a tourism brand. It's not to attract investment, it's not to attract, it's not about love. it's tourists. This is what this is for. Focus and the business will actually be successful. And then of course we had to do something which we don't do. But it was aligned with graphic designers, which is a logo. It's my favorite topic of the world is logos. I hate logos, I hate logos, and I have to keep on saying it. Here we go, I, I give a little bit of my brand is not a logo, you know, <laughs> the explanation about what is not, so that's my bad. Um, but the logo is a chair on the top, and yes, in cases you need logos, but most of the cases you don't need logos. I mean, what's the logo of Barcelona? Nobody knows. What's the logo of San Francisco? Nobody knows, but I said these names and you had images about it, you had emotions about it, that's what the brand is. It's not about the logo. I hate logos. I, if I could, I would prohibit logos. I hate logos, you know? 
But in this case, so we had to create something so that because this was not on the map, there was no perceptions around it. So we worked with a team of creative uh, people that were, they were very um, keen in understanding this. So they understood the concept about creating an inspirational destination. It was about creating a destination. A destination. A place. Something that has not existed yet. So today they call it Fashion City and it's Fashion City Brazil. So we have the flag and we use the abbreviation of what is Fashion City. We stylize it according to what is Brazil and what according to the Brazilian flag. And we merge them together and we create the brand. But again, I said it's a destination. So if you want to say that this is a destination, you need a flag. The ultimate representation of what is a destination is a flag when we talk about visual. So we created a flag, and we created a flag for this destination. Fashion City Brazil, Belo Horizonte, is a new destination that actually has its own flag, has its own logic of becoming a destination. And of course, this image is just a chair in the top, and it needs to reflect what about this. I mean, when I see this flag in these three colors, it has to have a multitude of colors, it has to have something to tell about. And if I say that I am a destination, I'm not going to have a marketing director. I'm going to have the Ministry of Inspiration. If I say I have a destination, I'm not going to have a CEO. I'm going to have a mayor. He's the mayor of this new town. So actually, we're creating the, using the codes of a place, of a, of a country, in this new city. And you have the Ministry of the Environment. We have the Ministry of Health, we have the Ministry of different aspects that actually work in the country. And I communicate this. And I say to the world, a new nation is being born in Minas, which is a state. And I show the flag and I say, what the hell is happening there? A new country inside a country? Yes, because I want this to be the reference in Brazil. They want this to be the reference in Brazil. They want other cities to look at this and to be inspired by this. So it's not just a case of the local stakeholders, it's about the rest of the country. And I communicate, and I even have a passport for this. <coughs> I give passports for people that actually live there. And I say, you live in a different philosophy. You need to inspire. And I even want to write a book about it, and what this is all about. And I, this is what I give to people when they go there. They can buy this also in any shop. People want to go to this place <coughs> feel inspired. And they can only feel inspired, not because of the pretty pictures, but actually when they go there, they actually can feel that experience. And of course, the classic thing is they all work, and so on and so forth, you know. So, but it's always consistent, and it's always alive. I mean, even the co-branding, you know, it's inspired in fashion season. And together with the airlines. Imagine you have the, the national flagship carrier saying it's the flagship carrier of that new destination, for instance. And so on. There's so many things that you can work with with this idea. Because <coughs> then everything flows, everything is okay. And then the, the beginning is always a little bit dense, it's a little bit, but then everything's automatic. It, it, you don't need to explain, oh, you're not doing it wrong. It comes naturally. And the challenge for us was to make them understand that this is theirs, it's not ours, and that this idea was already there. So I didn't invent anything, I just discovered what was there. And that's what we worked together. And again, when we talk about country branding, we talked about, of course, yes, those are the things, but look at all the underlay, look at all the size of this iceberg on, on all the things that you need to be consequent to actually become um, a destination. And again, we created this board, and we, which is not the board, but it was like the ministries or the uh, secretaries of state. And we actually gave names to them. We gave job roles. We gave key performance indicators. We have actually made an objective which was to increase the local GDP. The surrounding area is 2% by creating this project. 2% of Belo Horizonte. So this would have a direct impact on the nearest city, which has 2 million inhabitants, of 2%. A city that Google decided to actually put their headquarters in Brazil. So, talking about 1 billion cash a year. Thank you very much.